Hello, ladies. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us as we begin our five-week summer Women in the Word Bible study. Thank you so much for joining us online. I'm Deb Haygood, part of the Women in the World t Word teaching team, and I want to say welcome to you. I know some of you are out at South Campus watching this online. I want to say a special welcome to you. And some of you, I, I don't know where you are in your home, on vacation, around the world, wherever you are, a special welcome to you. I am so glad we have this internet capability so you can join us for this study online. This summer, we are going to be studying the era of judges. And you might say, why study judges? Well, last fall, if you were with us, we looked at the book of Joshua. And so we are continuing on with God's great story of love and salvation for humankind. In fact, that is what the Bible is. It's God's great love story for you and for me. We are going to look at this time of Judges, and it's a very interesting time. It's a dark time in the history of Israel. They are turning away from God and worshiping idols. They are being influenced by their pagan neighbors. It's a time of out-of-control immorality. Uh, in fact, J. Vernon McGee calls this a time of moral awfulness. And I kind of love that word, awfulness, because you're going to read some of these stories and think, wow, that is awful, awful. Uh, great um, political anarchy, there's mayhem, there's trouble. In fact, my grandfather would say, Debbie, this is a time of serious backsliding. And that is what we are going to see. So some of you may be thinking, well, then how does this fit into God's great story of love and salvation? How does all this trouble and mayhem and evil and sin, how does this fit in? Well, there are some great lessons that we are going to learn in this book of Judges, and you're going to find that it is very relevant, very relevant for you and me as women living today in 2021. In fact, as we talk about these Israelite sin, how they are um, moving away from the Lord, we see ourselves in that. We recognize that we are prone to wander away from the God who loves us. We too are influenced by uh, the world around us, not for good, but for bad. We too sometimes put other things over God, things we make things more important than God. And whenever we do that, even if it's good things, family, work, if it's more important to us than God, then that is an idol. So we can see ourselves in these Israelites. As we go on in the book, we're gonna see Israelite sin, God exercises discipline, um, there's consequences for their sins. And so he allows the enemies around them to oppress them. After a time, though, the Israelites will call out to God and God will deliver them from their enemy by raising up a leader. We call them judges. So now we discover that no, how, no matter how great the sin of the Israelites is, God's grace is greater still. And that's true for us as well. No matter how great your sin is, God's grace is greater still. Now, you may think, hey, you don't know my sin, Debbie. You don't know what I've thought, what I've done. I don't see God's grace being greater than that. Well, I want to tell you, hold on, because you're going to see God raise up some very unlikely, ordinary, and very, very flawed men and women to be leaders um, to rescue God's people. And through these unlikely heroes... We see God's faithfulness, we'll see his power, and we will see his amazing grace demonstrated. So look for yourself in these very exciting and interesting stories and look for God. We're going to learn much about God this summer. These stories are revelatory. That means they reveal God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In fact, one quote I read said that the book of Judges says more about the Holy Spirit than any other book in the Old Testament. Wow. So when you see the Holy Spirit, underline it. Take note on that. Look for yourselves in these stories, lady, and ladies, and experience God's grace, God's blessing, and God's purpose for you, you individually and personally. So let's turn to Judges 1.1, get started here. And I'm going to talk for a little bit about the history leading up to the Judges. 
Now I can hear some of you are groaning, you're thinking, history, oh no. But I just um, came to realize that history is really just the backstory. It's the backstory, and backstories are very popular right now. Movies are making a, a story before the story. They're calling them prequels. Star Wars has made this especially popular. I was kind of scrolling through the TV a couple months ago and I found this movie called Solo, A Star Wars Story. And the whole movie is about Han Solo. Now, if you know Star Wars, he is a major character in these Star Wars movies. And this whole movie is about Han Solo as a young man, how he got the name Solo, how he came upon the Millennium Falcon, his starship. So we're gonna spend a little time looking at the backstory to the book of Judges. I think it will give us t context. I think it will help us better understand the different judges that we're going to study. And the really cool thing is, this first chapter of Judges and part of chapter two gives us some of the backstory of Judges. So let's get started. Look at verse one. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. Okay, let me stop you right there. Those of you that have done your discussion questions together, you've seen some of these verses in chapter one. And when it says there, after the death of Joshua, you may be thinking, hey, these things we were reading about, this happened while Joshua was still alive. So what gives? Well, I have an explanation that I think makes a lot of sense. The author of the book of Judges uses this phrase, after the death of Joshua, as a heading for the whole book of Joshua. It tells us the time period. But then the author goes ahead and he tells us some of the things that led up to the era of Judges. Some of those stories that help us to um, explain why Israel is in the situation they are in. So this era of Judges bridges the time from Joshua's death to the time of the first king. And that is about 350 years. And we're gonna see Samuel, the last judge, anoint the first king under God's direction, and that is King Saul. By the way, Samuel is probably the author of the book of Judges. So you might remember in the book of Joshua that under Joshua's leadership, the Israelites obey God. They drive out the enemies and they settle the land. And this is really, we said, Israel's shining moment as they follow God and they obey God. As God fulfills to the Israelites the promise that he made to Abraham first and then to all of Abraham's descendants, the Israelites. He said that he would give them an inheritance of good land, good land. And you might remember that they were led out of Egypt by Moses. They'd been enslaved for 400 years and Moses leads them out and um, on to the promised land. They stopped for a little bit to build the tabernacle and to receive the law from God, the Ten Commandments. And then they go on to the edge of the promised land. And Moses sends in 12 spies. Now, two, 10 of the spies come back and say, wow, the land is good. It's lush and fertile and great, but there are giants living in the land. We cannot defeat them. Two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, they come back and say, that's all true, except we can defeat them. With God, he will bring us victory as we go into the land. But the people were scared. They didn't trust God completely. They failed to um, believe in his power. And so they cried and said, please, please don't send us in. We will surely die. And so God says, okay, well, have it your way. Then all of you adults, that's 20 years and older, you can wander around in this wilderness for 40 years until you have all died. And then your children who grow up, they will go in and settle the promised land. Along with Caleb and Joshua, the two spies, they feared God, they believed in God, and they followed God wholeheartedly. So Moses dies, they're on the edge of the Jordan River, and then Joshua is appointed by God to lead them across the Jordan and take the land. Now, often we uh, become troubled over the conquests and the killing of these people, and so I just want to remind us that these people are pagan. They're known collectively as Canaanites, even though the different groups have different names, but these Canaanites have had hundreds and hundreds of years to turn to God, to worship him, to follow him. Many, many, many years before this, Abraham had come to this land. He was following God and he built an altar and he worshiped God. 
And they saw God, the living God, bless Abraham. But the Canaanites rejected God. They mocked him and they made their own wooden gods and worshiped them instead with vile and immoral practices. They were a wicked, evil people against God, enemies of God, and now their time of judgment had come. Way back when they were wandering around in the wilderness, Moses had to, uh, God had told Moses, tell the Israelites that when you go into the land, drive out all the inhabitants. Drive them all out. This was God's punishment, and he said, drive them out. And you see on your verse sheet, a couple of places he said it. One of them is Numbers 33, 55. God says, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And why will they trouble them? Look at Exodus 23. God says, you shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. God says, drive them out. If they stay, they will turn you away from me and they will be a snare to you. They will bring you trouble. After the Israelites under Joshua had been fighting uh, the enemies and had been driving most of them out, it had been some years, probably around seven, um, God tells Joshua, okay, now the time has come to divide up the land and settle it among the 12 tribes. And then each tribe will be responsible for completing the task of driving out the enemy. God would go before them and give them the victory. So that's what they do. They divide up the land. But as we studied those last chapters in Joshua, and then Judges chapter 1 reviews this for us, the tribes, for whatever reason, fail to trust and obey God's power for victory. They do not drive out all of the enemies. I don't know, maybe they were tired, maybe they, their faith had grown weak, but they all fail to obey the Lord totally. And we see that. Um, maybe Judah does the best job. The tribe of Judah comes first, those are the verses 2 through 20. We see them driving out the enemy, but even Judah fails to completely obey God. And we see that in verse 19. Read that with me. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Now, that verse doesn't mean God couldn't drive out these enemy with chariots of iron. God could have driven them out with a puff of breath. It means that Judah failed to trust God and God's power to be able to defeat the enemy with chariots of iron. And then we go on. It's not just Judah, but we see all the tribes. Look at verse uh, 21. But the people of Benjamin, they did not drive out the Jebusites. And then look down at verse 27. Manasseh, they did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. And look at 29. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. And 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants. And 31, Asher. And 33, Naphtali. And then we see Dan down in verse 34. All of the tribes of Israel fail to fully obey God and drive out the enemies as they settle the land. Why is this? Maybe their faith had grown weak, but maybe look back at verse 30. Zebulun did, drive, did not drive out the inhabitants, and then look down at the second part of that verse. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Maybe some of the tribes thought, let's leave a little bit of the enemy and we can um, use them for forced labor. Or maybe we can charge them taxes. Maybe this made them seem like they would be successful or powerful. Maybe they were just greedy. We don't know, but for whatever reason, they fail to fully obey God. And so let's see what God's response is. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgad to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. All right, I want to stop right there and talk for a minute about the angel of the Lord. That, ladies, is the pre-incarnate Christ. That is Jesus. 
Now in the New Testament, we see Jesus, he comes to earth. He's fully God and fully man, and he's walking around. In the Old Testament, we see Jesus as the pre-incarnate Christ. And here he is. Oftentimes he's called the angel of the Lord. And so this is Jesus speaking to them. And he says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? The important thing we see here is that Jesus says, I will never break my covenant with you. God will remain faithful. Israel will be unfaithful, but God will remain faithful. You can almost hear the sadness in these words when he says, why, why have you not obeyed me? God wanted to bless them. He wanted to provide for them and protect them and to have a relationship with them. He wanted to bless them, but they did not obey him. And so they squandered the blessing in this good land. And what is the consequence in verse three? Jesus says, so now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides and the God shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept and they called the name of the place Bochum and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So Bochum, that word means weeping. So when they heard these words of Jesus, they wept because they knew they needed God. They wanted God. They needed his blessing and his love and his provision. But they had disobeyed him. They realized that. They sacrificed to the Lord. And verse 7 tells us, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. So this generation that had come into the land with Joshua they realize they haven't totally obeyed God, but they are going to continue to serve him, to follow him till the end of Joshua's life. And this is going to end the backstory or the history leading up to Judges. And with verse 8, we start the time of the Judges. So what can we learn from this? You know, I think as we see these Israelites failing to obey God, when we um, let the world influence our words, our actions, our lifestyles, if we're honest, we know it brings us trouble and mayhem. It may feel like thorns in our sides. So I just want to encourage us ladies to lean into the Lord, obey him, and let the Lord influence our words and our deeds our actions, our lifestyles, and then receive blessing. Receive the blessing that God has for us. So now let's go on and look at verse 8. We're going to start this time period of Judges. So verse 8 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him, and if you'll drop down, they buried him in the hill country of Ephraim. That was the tribe where he was from. And verse 10 says, And all the generations also were gathered and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So Joshua dies along with all those that had come into the promised land with him, that generation that had fought the enemy, that had settled the land, that had seen the um, great works of the Lord. They die as well. And it tells us that what happens next? A generation rises up after them without knowing the Lord God or what he had done for Israel. Oh, no. Oh, no. How has this happened? Did the parents, the leaders, the aunts, uncles, grandmas, did they fail to tell the children of the mighty works of God? Mighty works of God. Those works where we read them in the book of Joshua, the Lord pushes back the waters of the Jordan River in flood tide and the two million Israelites walk through the dry land into the promised land. And what about the battle of Jericho? They're walking around this fortified city and they shout and the walls come tumbling down and all the victories that we see, God giving the Israelites, they didn't tell the children those stories now, we know telling children the stories about God's important, 
Moses had told them this on your verse sheet, Deuteronomy 6, 7. Now, the verses right before that, this is where Moses is saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and put these words in your heart. And then in verse 7, he says, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. It's important to tell the children about the Lord. If you don't tell them, who else will? So tell the little ones about God. Tell them the Bible stories. Tell the teenagers what you talk to God about, how he answers your prayers. Tell the young adults the stories of God. As you're driving in your car and walking on the way, as you see a beautiful sunset, point it out to your children and say, look what the creator God has put in the sky. He is a magnificent artist. Tell the stories of God to the little ones so that they will know. Don't leave it for someone else to do. And then look at verse 11, and we're going to see what happens when a generation does not know the Lord. Verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. Those are the gods, the pagan gods of the Canaanites. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. They worshipped other gods, false gods, not real gods. They turned their back on their Lord God who loved them. They deserted Yahweh, Yahweh, their personal God. And God removes his hand of protection. And now the Israelites are in a bad way, a bad way. They're oppressed and they're plundered by the very enemies that God had told them to drive out. They're in great pain and distress. We see that the Israelites were unfaithful. But remember, God remains faithful. Over and over again, we'll see this. Israel is unfaithful. God remains faithful. So look down at verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges. Look at verse uh, 18 there. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. So we see that God raises up at different times judges, military leaders, and God was with that judge and he delivered the Israelites from the hand of their oppressor. And then they would live in a time of peace. Do you see God's power demonstrated in this? Do you see God's amazing grace. But let's see what happens. Verse 19, but whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. And if you drop down to chapter 3, verse 6, it says, and their daughters, they took to themselves. This is, they're talking about the enemies and their own daughters they gave to the enemy's sons and they served their gods. <clears throat> so we see that after the judge dies, then that God's people, they go back to following other gods. They didn't stop any of their wrong, evil practices. They stubbornly, it says, stubbornly continued. In fact, it says they were more corrupt than their fathers before them. And so this cycle begins over and over again. First, we see sin. And all these words are going to start with an S. First, we see sin. The Israelites turn their back on God. Then there's servitude. God allows them to be uh, disciplined by the oppression of their enemies. Third, we see supplication. The Israelites call out to God. And then we have salvation. God graciously raises up a judge, a deliverer, to defeat the enemy and save Israel. 
And then they turn back to God and worship God and they experience a time of peace or rest, or we're going to call it silence. Then, usually, when the judge dies, the Israelites turn away from God in sin. They're oppressed by their enemies in servitude. They call out to God, that supplication. God raises up a judge and there's salvation. And then there's a time of rest or silence. This cycle is repeated over and over again in the time of judges. I have a slide that depicts this cycle and you can see that it is a downward spiral. Over and over again, this cycle is repeated, but each time they are a little more corrupt, more and more corrupt. Each time they're more like their enemies and their culture and less like God's people who have a faithful, powerful God of love and amazing grace. So what can we learn from this? <clears throat> you know, sometimes we get caught up in our own cycle of stubbornly continuing with our wrong actions, our wrong patterns of behavior, our wrong words that we speak to others. How can we break this cycle? <clears throat> well, first of all, I think we have to remember to teach our children about God. I have another verse that reminds us of that, Psalm 78, 4. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Tell the children about God. And then second, listen to godly leaders. We just read they would not listen to the judges. Listen to godly leaders and the next follow God. Obey his word. Study it. Know it. Just exactly what you all are doing. And then do it. What does God want us to do? We see all throughout scripture. He wants us to love him, to worship him, praise him. He wants us to be kind to others and love one another. We see that in Ephesians. In Philippians, it tells us esteem others in humility. In Colossians, we read forgive others and encourage others. Follow God's word, obey him. And then do not compromise with your culture. So what does that mean? What does that mean and how do we do that? Well, it's not easy and I have no easy answers. This is very hard. But I think you have to know God's word and you have to be discerning. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to this world, <clears throat> but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are in the world but we are not to be of the world. We are to be giving a good example to the world. So talk to God. Ask him every day when you wake up, how do I do that? And he will give you wisdom. When we ask for wisdom, God will give us wisdom. So let's move on, and we're going to take a quick look at the first three judges. But first I want to talk about the job description of the judges. And they had many different roles. And that kind of reminds me of a story of a judge I met once that had many different roles. This happened many, many years ago. In fact, I was a sophomore in college. I was 20 years old. My brother had come to visit me, and he was 19. And so we decided to get in the car, drive to Arkansas, and visit our grandparents. So we're on the way. We're on I-30. Uh, we're outside of some little town in Texas. And a policeman pulls us over, and he gives my brother a ticket for speeding. And then he says, I want you to come into the town and pay the ticket. So we're like, oh, okay. So we get off the freeway. We follow him into this little town, stop before this little building, park the car. He opens the door and we walk in. He tells us where to stand. And then he walks around this big desk and he puts on a black robe and he sits down and he goes, the court is in session. And he looks at the ticket and he looks at us and he says, I see that you have been speeding, that, that this ticket says you have been speeding. How do you plead? And my brother says, well, guilty. And he says, okay, that will be $20. Pay the clerk. So we look over and here's a little desk. And so the judge stands up, takes off his black robe, walks out, goes over to the desk. And he says, that will be $20. And my brother, and here's where the Lord was with us. My brother had $25 with him. That's all the money that he had brought with him to Texas. And I had $5. And so anyway, we had $10 left when we finished. So my brother gives the guy the $20 and he writes out a receipt and he says, you are free to go. 
And we walked out and we didn't know if we should start laughing or start running. That was weird. Now these judges that we're gonna look at, they're not exactly like that, but they also are not like the judges we think of in black robes. These judges are not officially elected. They're not appointed by the people. They do not inherit the office. Instead, they are raised up sovereignly by God at different times over this 350 year time period. They're primarily military leaders leading the men into battle. Sometimes they're civil leaders. They actually are settling disputes. Sometimes they're political leaders. And you're gonna see that they are not chosen based on their spiritual maturity. In fact, you're gonna often think, wow, that seems like a very unlikely person to be a judge. Hold on. They are not necessarily leader, uh, national leaders, but they are tribal leaders. They're not necessarily ruling over all 12 tribes at any one time. Now we have a map for you. We've handed it out and then you also, we have a screenshot of it there. And here you can see that the uh, judges are spread out all over the promised land. They come from all different tribes. That's what those colored uh, places on the map, those are the different tribes and the judges come from all of those tribes at different times over this 350 years. One more thing, they are oppressed by different enemies. We've called them collectively Canaanites, but they have different names such as the Moabites, the Midianites, the Philistines, many other uh, groups that are living among the Israelites. So let's uh, look now down at verse 7, and we're going to look at our first judge, Othniel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth. So there's the sin. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of, we're just going to call him Cushan, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan eight years. There's the servitude. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, supplication, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, salvation. And Othniel is that person. He's the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Now let's stop for a minute. We have heard a little bit about Othniel in the book of Joshua, and that story is repeated in Judges 1, uh, I think verse 12. And it talks about how he was the nephew of Caleb. Caleb, that larger than life, that faithful believer who followed God wholeheartedly. He had said, anyone that goes in and drives out the enemies of this town, I will give my daughter. And we see that Othniel does that. He is a brave warrior, or maybe he just wanted the prize. Caleb's daughter, Aksa. But whatever, this is the story we know of Othniel. Now, verse 10 tells us, the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan, so that the land had rest 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, dies. We see that God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, is on Othniel. The Holy Spirit who transforms men and women beyond their own capabilities. The Holy Spirit gives power and strength and wisdom. Next, we see that he judges Israel. So it appears that he's not only a civil leader settling disputes, but he is also a mighty successful military leader as the Lord gives Othniel victory over the king of Mesopotamia. The land has rest then for 40 years until Othniel dies. So that's judge number one. Not too much about him, but he looks like a pretty good guy. So let's read verse 12 and we're gonna see our second judge, Ehud. Verse 12, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so there's sin. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And it says how he gathers people, look down at 14, and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. There is the servitude. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute to him, to Eglon, the king of Moab. So let's stop there for a second, talk about Ehud. We see that he is from the tribe of Benjamin and that he is left-handed. 
Now, sometimes being left-handed back in this day and time was considered a weakness, an abnormality. It's a handicap. In fact, that phrase, left-handed, that you see in verse 15, it means hindered in the right hand. We don't know if something was wrong with his right hand or if he was just a left-handed guy. But we're going to see this seemingly handicap is the very thing that God will use to defeat Eglon, the king of Moab. So Ehud takes tribute money to the king. And verse 16 tells us that Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, that's about 15 inches, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. Now, the significance of that is most soldiers, right-handed, they would all have their swords on their left thigh so that they would reach over with their right hand, grab the sword, and start slashing away. But Ehud is left-handed. So he is able to hide this sword on his right thigh. He's going to grab over with his left hand and grab it. And the significance of that is when you go in before the king and the soldiers guarding them would look at you or maybe even pat down that left thigh because most men were right-handed. And so Ehud is able to go into the king. So he brings this tribute, but we see that for some reason he leaves with his men. He goes out and he tells the men with him to go back uh, to Ephraim and then he goes back to see the king and he says I have a message for the king and so he gets this private audience with King Eglon look at verse 20 and Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber and Ehud said I have a message from God for you and he arose from his seat and Ehud reached with his left hand took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly a uh, very, very fat belly. So fat, in fact, that this 15-inch sword goes all the way in and the fat closes over it and King Eglon dies. Now, this is a very graphic story and it even becomes more graphic. We're not going to read that part. But as the king dies, Ehud is able to uh, leave, go out onto the balcony, escape, and the servants find the door locked. They wait for a while. And so Ehud has time to get back to the Israelites that are in the hills of Ephraim. And he says, let's go and defeat the, Mo the uh, Moabites. And that's exactly what happens. The Moabites are caught completely off guard. And it says they kill all the Moabites, any strong, able-bodied men, not one man escaped. And so Moab is subdued. Look at verse 30. Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land had rest for 80 years. I want us to go back, though, and look at that verse 20 one more time where it says, uh, I have a message from God for you. Ehud did have a message from God. God had told Ehud this plan on how to kill the king. And Ehud obeys God. He listens to God and he does God's will. And the king is killed and Moab is subdued under the mighty, gracious hand of God. God uses this left-handed man to deliver God's people. Then our third judge, Shamgar, he gets just one verse. Let's look at it, verse 31. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. So this story probably takes place during this time period of the 80 years of rest, and the significance of this judge is that he uses an ox goad to kill 600 Philistines. Now, an ox goad is a simple farm tool. It's a really thick, stout stick. about It's long, about eight feet long. And on the end of it is a sharp metal tip. And it was used to prod the oxen. It was a common farm tool used by poor farmers in that day. God doesn't need fancy weapons or chariots and horses. In fact, we are going to see some um, very interesting things that God will use. He uses whatever is available. Look at these things in the weeks to come. A hammer, a torch, and a trumpet, a jawbone. God can use whatever is available. God calls and he graciously empowers these three willing judges using their handicaps, their weaknesses to bring victory.
And he can do the same with us. If we are willing, God can use our weaknesses, our handicaps, our flaws, no matter what our past history. We are not disqualified. If we believe in God and we're willing, God can use us in different ways to bring him glory, to bring him glory. One of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 12, 9 on your verse sheet. And this is Paul. He's talking about what Jesus had said to him. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, Paul says, then I am strong. Ladies, let your weaknesses become strengths under the powerful, faithful, gracious hand of God. I hope you come back next week as we study Deborah. It's a super great story. You don't want to miss it. And I hope you come back every week after that so that you can see over and over again God's faithfulness, God's power, and God's amazing grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are amazing. You are good. And you are great, you are faithful, you are mighty. You provide for us, you protect us, you love us. Father, your grace is amazing. Lord, I pray as we study these stories, interesting and and awful and wild, Lord, I pray that we will see you, that we will learn more about you, and that we will learn about ourselves how to follow you and love you more and more. Lord, I pray blessings upon all that are studying these uh, judges this summer. I pray you would bless us and draw us close to you. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.